well thanks a lot thanks a lot for those kind words uh, rumpa ma'am shujashmita ma'am um, i can just say that uh, i i am extremely happy and elated and i feel extremely lucky to be present here to have received this offer from mohistala college of course uh, rishav uh, the man behind all this he couldn't be here due to some other engagements so uh, that's a shame uh, but well uh, you people have been really uh, extremely kind to me in saying all those words but uh, let me tell you that i i regard myself as just a reader nothing more than that i mean i remember coming first across tintin when i was a, a paltry 6 year old boy in the pages of anandamala which most of us uh, have uh, have the same story right it's anandamala which first brought tintin amongst us and Uh, i remember the quality of the translation was so good that i actually used to think that tintin was a bengali uh, and i kind of continued this uh, misapprehension for some two or three years and uh, the idea broke when i actually came across tintin in tibet because there we found uh, tintin introducing captain haddock to kutub minar and red fort and uh, there was when i started thinking that Uh, a globe trotter like tintin why hasn't he uh, visited kutub minar and red fort before i mean is that uh, does it mean that he is not an indian i mean he is from an outside country uh, and then the way he interacted with those indians in new delhi and uh, his uh, regretting uh, that he couldn't see the gandhi memorial at rajghat so that is where i first started uh, doubting about tintin's racial identity and of course later uh, i was in class 3 when our english teacher told us that he actually belonged to belgium so uh, for someone who had been following the boy reporters exploit since i was 6 years old this means this is a huge opportunity for me i mean giving a, a lecture on tintin i mean i don't know it it marks an extremely important moment in my life uh, so okay without uh, much ado let me begin uh, as i uh, made it clear at the outset this lecture uh, won't have any particular thematic hinging uh, i prefer it to be a more general kind of lecture uh, on the text uh, of course i won't be giving summaries and character portraits and all that because i guess the students have already uh, read the text and then read the basic story Uh, and the character portraits what we will be doing instead uh, we will be looking at some themes in the text uh, which i personally feel are less talked about and which need to be discussed uh, why tintin in tibet holds a unique place in ages oeuvre so yeah to begin at the beginning then uh, a word or two about ajay the man his uh, of course uh, people know that his real name was george prosper remy he was born in etabik brussels on 22nd may 1907 uh, and tintin he has been writing it for 47 years it has been uh, resulted in 23 full fledged albums and it has been translated into 58 languages all over the world tintin first made its appearance in la vingtieme siecle which was a belgian catholic daily uh, norbert wallis the editor of the daily when adje used to work there he noticed his talent and gave him the offer to work in one of the supplements of uh, le vingtieme siecle which was named le petit vingtieme uh, which used to come out on thursdays and it was in 1929 that tintin made its first appearance in the pages of la petite vtm tintin became extremely popular and on thursdays the subscription of la vtm cecle underwent an increase at first it became doubled then quadrupled then sextupled so two times then four times then six times uh so in the beginning let me say uh tintin was not really the liberal kind of character which we generally think him to be uh, our idea about tintin is somebody who rises above petty party politics and fights for universal humanist values and such and such but let me tell you 
Tintin was not like that in the beginning. When Ajay started writing the strips of Tintin in the pages of Le Vetiems uh, it used to be a Catholic newspaper, and Norbert Wallace was a right-winged Catholic. Uh, so he was strictly against communist principles, and he wanted Ajay to invent a hero, a young hero who will be able to teach the young readers of Le Petit Vetiem and the communist anti-socialist principles let's say so thereby we find tintin venturing into the land of the soviets tintin and the land of the soviets is his first adventure and if you read tintin in the land of the soviets uh, it kind of seems a bit surprising to us especially if you people have read uh, later works like flight 714 or tintin and the picaros uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets comes across as almost crude. I mean, you find people blaming about uh, RJ creating stock characters and Tintin being a flat character throughout his works. It's actually not so, because if you read the texts carefully, you will find that there is a definite uh, streak of development. The way Tintin has become more complicated, the way the plots have become more complicated, and uh, the way RJ has refused to stereotype uh, people. So, the first book, Tintin in the Land of the Stoke on the Soviets, it comes across as very, very stereotyped. Tintin ventures into the land of the Bolsheviks and it's almost like RJ from the beginning made it a point to show the Bolsheviks as very, very bad. You find that uh, they have ruined Russia and they are stockpiling uh, crops. Agriculture is undergoing a total failure. And uh, the socialists, while discussing among themselves, the Bolsheviks are saying that uh, there are no more crops, but we need some because we will have to show uh, the capitalist countries that we are very much well off. So you find that all, although they couldn't provide enough crops for their own poor, they are giving away huge amount of crops as uh, help to other countries. And that's precisely to show that how people are extremely well off in Russia. So they are pulling off this facade of prosperity. While people in Russia are dying, they are starving, and uh, the communists, uh, the socialists, they, the Bolsheviks, they also come across as very, very narrow-minded. Uh, they want to straightjacket everyone into the principles of communism. I mean, there is a st there is a scene where uh, you find the Bolshevik officers giving food to poor children. They have poor children lined up, and the only one question which they ask before distributing the food crops is, "Are you a communist?" I mean, young people who do not even know how to spell communism are being made to say that I am a communist. And when a boy refuses to say so, they uh, abuse him and hurl him onto uh, the street. Tintin, of course, saves the boy. And then there is a scene where there is uh, an election going on and the communist officers, the Bolshevik officers, they say that hereby we will read out to you the name of every contestants and you people, we urge you to say which contestant do you like. And um, first of all, they read out the name of the communist uh, the communist contestant in the election and they hold the entire population at gunpoint and tell them uh, do you have any kind of uh, complaints against this contestant so very obviously since they are holding them at gunpoint the people keep quiet and then you find the bolshevik officers declaring that okay nobody has any complaints against the communist contestant so hereby we declare him to be the election winner uh, so you find things like that and uh, RJ shows the Bolsheviks uh, preparing medieval torture chambers where they once imprisoned Tintin. Uh, and there are uh, monstrous looking people waiting to torture anyone who goes, uh, who refuses uh, to enter into the communist principle. So it's a text which seems very, very, uh, let's say, mono layered. 
uh, RJ was of course uh, proceeding with pre-formed ideas here uh, and his one political agenda was to put Bolshevism in very bad light. Uh, and after that, the same kind of stereotyping kind of continued in his second work, uh, Tintin in Congo. Uh, and when he goes to Congo, of course, uh, Tintin is not as violent as he is in the land of the Soviets. And let me also add that when you read Tintin in the land of the Soviets, he actually comes across as a young boy who is asking for trouble. Uh, the kind of Tintin which we know, the man who always stands for virtue and who never loses his temper. And of course, that is why Captain Haddock is kept at his side, right? Haddock is meant to be a foil. Haddock is somebody who is accustomed to losing his temper at the drop of a hat, while Tintin always remains equal-tempered, equal-minded. He's very, very tough to crack. Uh, however, if you read uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets, you'll see that Tintin is quick to catch offense. And there are a number of occasions where he physically hurts the communists. And uh, there are a number of stages where he almost enjoys in showing off his physical strength, something which is very, very much unexpected of someone like Tintin. I mean, he almost invites uh, the Bolshevik officers saying like, come on, buddy, come on, let's see, let's see who's more powerful. Come on. Yeah. It's almost like a college kid waiting to pick a fight, a bully kind of a guy. Uh, anyway. Uh, when we come to Congo Tintin or uh, Tintin in Congo, I mean, I might uh, move into the Bengali names because uh, let me make this clear at the very outset. I still prefer reading the Bengali translations of Tintin. I mean, I know it's not possible to include Bengali translations in uh, the syllabi because after all, it's a department of English we are dealing with. But I personally am absolutely in love with the Bengali translations. Uh, so I still prefer reading Tintin in Bengali. Uh, anyway, uh, when we read Tintin in Congo or uh, Congo Tintin, uh, we find that uh, there is certainly a bit of a development from Tintin's old high school avatar in land of the Soviets. He is much more equal tempered, but he still comes across as a Bula Matari or a good white guy traveling in uh, the land of darkness. I mean, he's uh, almost like a Conradian Kurds traveling uh, in the benighted land of Africa and hoping to enlighten the Congolese people. Uh, he goes there and when he meets uh, the Congolese, there is a state, a stage where his his uh, car crashes into uh, a train uh, which was carrying uh, a number of Congolese people and they are absolutely offended. I mean, the picture of the Congolese there, I mean, uh, it's obvious why the Africans have been very much uh, offended by uh, Tintin in the Congo uh, because uh, they are shown to be very irritated when Tintin comes there and they tell Tintin that you mischievous white man, you have ruined our uh, train and then of course Tintin we find him to hold his temper there amidst a bunch of shouting uh, black people he tells them that wait wait uh, let me see and I will repair your old engine uh, and as soon as he uses the word old engine there is one Congolese who breaks in saying that hey it's not an old engine uh, it's pretty good. We have been using it for, uh, we have been using it with absolute ease. So who the hell are you to say that it's an old engine and thereby it has broken down. So anyway, you find them very quarrelsome and uh, unwilling to work. Yeah. So uh, when Ajay was writing Tintin in the Congos, uh, the description of the Congolese people, they fit into every stereotype which uh, let's say uh, imperialist countries like England and Belgium, of course, uh, you must not forget that Belgium was holding sway over Congo, uh, King Leopold's Belgium. And they were also indulging in slave trade, let's not forget. Uh, which again, uh, George William Washington, uh, a guy from uh, the United States, he uh, went into the heart of the Congo uh, in order to uh, investigate into the matter 
and he is the one who actually uh, divulged the whole secret that king leopold's belgium is engaging in slave trade in congo and thereby belgium uh, was uh, i mean uh, they received a lot of scolding uh, from the league of nations and Uh, this is one uh, historical story which has been shown in let me tell you uh, an english film in which uh, sent years david yetzer's the legend of tarzan uh, where uh, yetzer shows uh, yetzer thems and he's now directing uh, fantastic beasts uh so uh that film shows uh tarzan teaming up with george william washington uh george william washington is of course played by uh, the redoubtable samuel jackson uh, and they go into africa into uh, congo to divulge uh, the secret of uh, belgium indulging in slavery so uh, anyway uh, in congo tintin you find the picture of the congolese uh being truthful or uh, being consistent to every kind of stereotype which the west has cooked up about africa uh, about the african natives let's say superstitious uh, uh these were some of the popular stereotypes right when you read uh, let's say victorian authors like david livingstone uh, or richard barton and of course the entire corpus of african adventure story is very much popular in victorian period i mean people like uh, maybe not henry rider hagard he was uh, a bit uh, he was a uh, kind of an exception because he lived in south africa uh, during uh, a considerable period of his life he liked the africans personally but uh, people like uh, let's say george alfred henty and r m ballantine if you read their books uh, they have said that the africans are one they are lazy two they are ignorant three they are quarrelsome child like four they are superstitious again child like and you find every one of these stereotypes uh, playing out very well in congo tintin the black people are quarrelsome they are ready to pick a fight with tintin as soon as he accidentally bumps into their engine they are lazy there is a point where Tintin and Snowy are working head over heels in order to repair the engine and the black people are just standing aside and there is a point where Tintin tells one of the black people uh, don't you feel ashamed like uh, let's say an adamant white man don't you feel ashamed the dog is working so much uh, pointing at snowy of course the dog is working so hard to put the engine back in order while you people absolutely able bodied you stand aside and do not take part in the proceedings and one of them uh, surprisingly tells tintin uh, no but if we uh, start working then our dresses will get soiled so and then uh, there is the picture of the superstitious native when tintin runs into problems with a witch doctor uh, who is afraid that his uh, influence will get uh, decreased uh, because tintin is becoming fast popular among uh, the congolese because of course he is the bula matari the good white man uh, and it is the same stereotype which you find again in tintin in america the third book where uh, tintin travels in the wild west into the red indian territory the native americans of course they are more or less being portrayed as uh, well superstitious quarrelsome uh, there is a point when uh, tintin becomes uh, starts uh, when he ventures into the indian territory he is of course chasing an infamous chicago drug lord uh named bobby smiles and bobby smiles ventures into the indian territory and tells the indian uh, king or the tribal leader that uh, that guy meaning tintin who is uh, hot on bobby smiles trails uh, that guy is coming with uh, a violent heart he means harm to the native americans so imprison him as fast as you can and the native american tribal lord of course being the uh let's say the stupid native he is uh, that is how rj represents him in the work he believes bobby smiles the imprisoned tintin but they are uh, so indisciplined they are superstitious uh, uh they cannot go into war because they have lost their axe the sacred axe meant for battle 
and uh, when they are uh, finding it, uh, Bobby smiles is irritated and he says that, "Oh my God, these people they will never go into battle. I will have to do everything by myself." But anyway, when they finds it out, they go into battle. Uh, they imprison Tintin, but before killing him, Tintin is of course sentenced to death. But before killing him, they indulge into a quarrel amongst themselves. So again, the European stereotype of the natives being so childlike that they cannot do anything unitedly. They are bound to break into battle amongst themselves. I mean, that is the reason why the British were ruling uh, the Asians and the Africans, right? They are not fit enough to mat mature enough to govern themselves. So you find all these stereotypes in Aziz's work, but there is one very important moment in his career when he started writing the Blue Lotus, uh, and the event was. His friendship with Shang Zhongzhen. Uh, Shang Zhongzhen, he was a Chinese sculptor, painter, and poet. Uh, and it is after coming into friendship with Shang that R.J. learned a lot about non-European cultures. I mean, you can almost say that friendship with Shang changed R.J.'s whole outlook. And the Blue Lotus, the work which R.J. produced after his friendship with Chang, it remains a landmark achievement in the Tintin oeuvre. The Blue Lotus reaches an entirely different uh, level of sophistication because R.J. before the Blue Lotus and after the Blue Lotus is almost, let's say, unrecognizable in his outlook. The R.J. before was writing Tintin Adventures, but uh, it's obvious that he was writing it with great speed. He was not undergoing uh, meticulous research, which became his trademark during the later works. I mean, why do we love Tintin so much? Because of its meticulous research work, right? And that's another reason why Shotoji Rai was so fond of Tintin comics, uh, because he was also somebody who was very fond of research. I mean, if you read his Feluda and Shonko stories, they are so detailed, incredibly detailed, and the graphic descriptions, they almost can be, uh, uh, I mean, they can be termed as a comics without pictures. Uh, so anyway, uh, if you read The Blue Lotus, it is entirely different from what RJ has been doing before this. Uh, before this, the four or five adventure books which he had already produced, uh, well, after uh, American Tintin, of course, uh, there is uh, the, Black Island, uh, the Black Island and the other works, uh, where you see uh, Tintin almost breathlessly going from one adventure to the next. Uh, and the backgrounds, if you see the panels, of course, uh, the individual pictures in a comic book, they are called panels, and the free space in between the panels is called gutters. Uh, if you look at the panels uh, in the early Tintin works, they are mainly monochromatic. The background is generally dealt with in a single color. Uh, it is generally deserted. I mean, uh, there is uh, nowhere can be found that abundance of buildings and posters and uh, newspaper cuttings and uh, people running around in different uh, clothing, which became a trademark in the later books. If you look at the background in the later Tintin works, they are so crowded with details. He was not doing them in his early works. Uh, and he, and uh, the manner of the stories, if you read them, uh, the Tintin stories uh, during its early days, they are almost picaresque uh, tales. I mean, Tintin moves on from one adventure to the next. I mean, uh, there are stages where uh, we think that, oh, okay, he'll die now. I mean, uh, well, he'll die, he'll die. Oh, no, yeah, he has escaped death once more. I mean, there are uh, a number of moments in every story when he has close brushes with death. And there is a kind of breathless quality in the early stories where uh, you almost find that Tintin does not stop and reflect on his... Uh, predicament he just rushes off from one new brush with death to the next those of course changed in the blue lotus uh, when you read the blue lotus you find that rj has learned to take his time before producing a tintin adventure and that is where you find a serious engagement with world politics I mean, of course, before you find tintin representing a general principle of good where he's going against 
let's say imperialism where he's going against capitalism and all uh, sorts of things uh, which are supposed to be bad but it is in the blue lotus where you find aj dealing with these evils in greater detail in the blue lotus uh, of course it was written during uh, a period where uh, the japanese were invading china and they were uh, subjecting china to an uh, an almost imperial rule and uh, rj takes great pains to show how the chinese common people were tortured under the japanese i mean the bad guy mitsu hidato is a japanese uh, and uh, you see uh, there is a white man who is beating the poor chinese and he is at the same time he is uh, saying that we need to treat this yellow baboons Uh, according to their standards we need we need to teach them some civility these yellow baboons must be kept under our boots and at the same time you can see him waxing poetic about uh, the let's say the virtues of western civilization so this is where rj was actually dealing in greater detail with let's say the contradiction in western civilization where it tells a lot of good things about itself but simultaneously it oppresses the people which it holds under colonial rule and the japanese were no exception in that sense uh, they have become let's say the new colonial power in the east and they are also subjugating the common people the chinese people and uh, this is of course where tintin meets chang uh so and uh, the friendship with chang uh chang the character in tintin is introduced as an orphan boy whom tintin saves from drowning and it is this friendship with opens tintin's eyes to the truth that people from other races may be not that other after all because as soon as he saves chang the first question that chang asks him is that why did you save me and tintin is of course flabbergasted i mean he is like uh, his facial expression almost tells the story he is like well why the hell won't i save you uh, isn't that what a human being is supposed to do and then chang of course tells him that uh, i thought the white people are evil because they killed my forefathers in the in the waksa rebellion uh, and that kind of uh, created in me the kind of uh, let's say a stereotypical belief that all white people are evil and then of course they start discussing about uh, the respective prejudices which they hold in their own minds tintin tells chang that all white people are not evil and he also tells him that you know i used to think that all chinese people are evil i mean all uh, there are a lot of white people who used to think that all chinese people are evil they are superstitious they are uh, let's say hypocrites uh, they like cheating with other people and they still uh, sub uh, they still subsist on bird eggs they eat raw bird eggs and uh, the feet of the chinese women those are uh, they are artificially uh, made small uh, they are imprisoned in uh, iron rings uh, so they still follow these kind of medieval customs and whenever they find that a child is born unfit they kill it so uh, the europeans still a lot of europeans still think that the chinese follow these kind of medieval uh, customs in their lives and as soon as chang hears it he breaks out laughing says that the white people must be crazy aren't they uh, so uh, that is where uh, rj Uh, let's say is delivering one of his most uh, strong condemnation of racial prejudice you find tintin a white man and chang a yellow man uh, in that sense of course it sounds very racist but again that is how the world thought during in those uh, times sitting side by side and they are discussing that after all we are not that much different because after all tintin and chang both are boys uh, chang is an orphan and no where do we see tintin's parents as well i mean tintin is somebody who lives alone with his dog in 26 labrador road in his flat and of course uh, gradually he will pick up uh, friends as he goes along his adventures so in that sense chang and tintin are very much similar 
young people without any guardians or any parents whatsoever they are completely on their own and then onwards they become fast friends i mean it's uh, it's obvious that uh, rj had in mind sang john jen uh, it is that chang whom he is representing in this story uh, well to go back to uh, rj let's say uh, the tintin books became extremely popular especially after the second world war uh, they started selling more than 150 million copies uh, over the world and uh, tintin in tibet uh, why i say so many things about chang is precisely because chang makes his reappearance in tintin in tibet uh, we see him last in the final panels of the blue lotus and that is where uh, another let's say significant thing happens when uh, chang is standing uh, uh, on the uh, let's say the dock of the port and tintin is waving goodbye to chang and mr wang who has agreed to be a foster parent of chang uh, tintin waves goodbye to them and you actually see a tear dripping down from tintin's eyes so uh, though earlier we find tintin to be the quote and quote the stiff upper lip white man in his adventures somebody who never breaks down who never gets nervous who always remains uh, let's say plucky the quote and quote plucky european boy i mean all those 19th century stereotypes about masculinity uh, uh, so much uh, uh, apparent in victorian adventure stories as well i mean a man was supposed to have a stiff upper lip I mean, who, why a stiff upper lip? Because uh, they were not supposed to be moved either in extreme happiness or in extreme pain. Because when you smile or when you cry, it is the stiff upper the upper lip which curls, right? Uh, so when you have a stiff upper lip, it means uh, uh, yeah, that's not a surgical disorder or something like that. It means that you remain equal tempered in the face of. both uh, extreme happiness and terrible sorrow i mean uh, you find tintin being straight jacketed into that stereotype largely during his earlier adventures and that is why he is treated as such uh, let's say a great example among the natives right i mean in the final panel of congo tintin you find uh, i mean it is certainly uh, significant that during the earlier adventures when tintin leaves a place after solving a mystery or after doing some brave deed everyone shakes hands with him and parts as a friend but only in congo tintin you find that people are treating him as let's say a model i mean you find uh, people saying that uh, the congolese saying that tintin is such a great man let's follow him as an example and even a congolese dog is being uh, said that be like tintin's dog he is such a great example so Uh, you again have that stereotype of the good white man who must be followed as a model by the ignorant natives and uh, that's precisely because he never breaks down in the face of even extreme danger but this is one rare moment in the blue lotus where you actually find tintin breaking down I and mean, it's almost unbelievable he is actually crying when he is leaving chang it kind of shows his human side right he has fallen so much in love with chang he is Pained uh, to be estranged from him, uh, so and then you find Chang returning in Tintin in Tibet. Tintin in Tibet uh, was, of course, uh, begun in September nineteen fifty eight. It was written at a time when it is one of uh, Tintin's later adventures. It is the twentieth Tintin album. Uh, it was begun in September nineteen fifty eight and completed in November nineteen fifty nine. uh it was uh, earlier meant to be titled uh, the the bear snout or the yak's snout but of course then rj thought better of it and uh, went back to the tried and tested formula of uh, tintin in uh, uh, that formula and uh, decided to name it uh, tintin in tibet uh, chang of course are just friend he had become estranged from him uh, in the wake of the second world war and uh, the the german invasion of belgium uh, 
RJ lost track of Chang and it was in 1975 that Chang was traced back again. After 45 years of estrangement, RJ got reunited with Chang when he was extremely unwell in 1981. And in uh, 1983, RJ actually died in 3rd March. So, uh, you uh, when he's writing Tintin in Tibet in 1958, uh, you see that kind of pain of being uh, of having lost track of Chang, his old friend. I mean, that is the reason why Tintin undertakes this journey, right? To find out Chang. So in that way, it is Arja's journey as well. The pain is real. He has lost Chang and cannot find him. Uh, uh, Ajay, of course, uh, wrote another couple of uh, series which people uh, know not much about. There was uh, one series named Quick and Fruke, and there is, of course, another series of his named uh, The Adventures of Josette and Joko, which was also translated into Bengali later. Uh, and uh, his style of drawing, uh, we know that uh, the style of drawing he followed was unique. It was called Ligne Clear or the clear line uh, drawing. So, Tintin in Tibet. Ajay himself said that it is a love story. Uh, a love story which symbolizes friendship. Uh, and he insisted that it has a message. When he gave his interview to Numa Sadul, uh, the interview named Tintin and I, he made it very clear that... Uh, this one is my personal favorite among all my Tintin albums. And uh, this story has a message. And what is that message? I think the most important theme in Tintin is, of course, friendship. Uh, Tintin in Tibet, of course, you people know the main storyline, so I will not go into it. Uh, the story is kind of uh, it is kind of unique in so many respects. First of all, you do not find the whole array of different characters which you find very often in the Tintin adventures. I mean, Tintin adventures are almost Dickensian in their variety of eccentric characters. But in this story, you find that the number of characters has been stripped down to the bare minimum. Uh, there is Tintin, the main characters. There is Tintin. There is his all-time pal Snowy, of course. There is another all-time pal, Captain Haddock. <laughs> there is Tharke, the brave Sherpa. And more or less, that's it. That's where uh, the list of important characters come to an end. All the other are more or less secondary, right? Uh, and there is, of course, Chang, who has got estranged. And, of course, there is the, the lovable snowman. Not abominable at all. First of all, uh, so uh, why did RJ do that? I guess it's because he wanted to uh, put our attention firmly on these uh, main characters because these were the ones through whom he will show his theme of friendship. And there is another important thing about Tintin in Tibet. It is perhaps the only Tintin story where there are no bad people, so to say. There are no villains. In the previous adventure we know before Tintin in Tibet had been uh, the Red Sea Sharks where there were a lot of bad people. There was the arch enemy of Tintin, Rasta Populus, disguised as Marquis the Gorgonzola. And then there was his sidekick Alan. Uh, even in the uh, next adventure, the Castafior Emerald, there is at least a magpie who can be treated as a culpable uh, baddie because it is... Uh, the bird who stole the diamond, right? Uh, uh, sorry, the emerald. In Tintin in Tibet, you can find absolutely no bad guys. Uh, and that is perhaps because the main obstacle here is nature itself. RJ himself was, of course, uh, going through a kind of psychological traumatic stage during the period when he wrote Tintin in Tibet. Uh, he was having frequent nightmares where uh, he will see uh, a white skeleton coming at him, trying to strangle him. And then he will have a whiteout, something like a blackout. Only uh, in blackout, the patient's uh, whole consciousness is covered in darkness. In Arj's case, he said that uh, it was 
con- uh, covered in a blinding white light so he was having a kind of white out and even after that he continued having nightmares when uh, he kind of imagined himself being deserted in a place with whiteness all around uh, and the problems uh, continued in such an to such an extent that he had to consult a psychologist somebody who was a direct uh, student of carl gustav jung and that person told rj that it was because uh, these nightmares were coming because rj was going through a psychological problem as his marriage with his first wife germain keken was almost uh, on the verge of breaking down and he had been indulging in a kind of extramarital affair with fanny vlaming <coughs> fanny vlaming was of course somebody who worked with her she is the one who later found the rj foundation in 1987 after rj's death in 1983 so since rj came from a conservative uh, catholic family his catholic values were kind of uh, Uh, creating a psychological problem for him a kind of uh, a feeling of guilt because he was uh, indulging in a relationship with another woman while being married so and uh, the consistent uh, white color in his nightmares uh, the psychologist says that it is urge a search for purity and he advised urge not to work anymore in such a, a mental state uh, he advised him to stop working Uh, because he said that uh, if you continue working uh, the toil and the stress will only uh, make the nightmares worse rj however refused he told him that i will continue working because uh, i think it is in work that i will find my salvation and he continued working in tintin in tibet he took another whole project on to him uh, while the psychological problems were continuing and later of course he said that i overcame uh, my problems uh, because when i started writing this book i stopped thinking about those problems and that kind of helped uh, for me and that helped uh, because i could take my mind elsewhere and when you read tintin in tibet it's obvious that those psychological problems played a big role in the way rj laid out the plot line of the story because tintin here is also uh, passing through a kind of traumatic stage uh, from the very onset in this book uh, you find that tintin is not his usual self right uh, again the kind of uh, the stiff upper lip tintin which we again find uh, during the middle period uh, the adventures after the blue lotus when rj was writing uh albums like let's say the crab with the golden claws or the seven crystal balls or red rackham's treasure or uh, explorers to the moon uh, destination moon you find tintin again uh, largely getting back to his stiff upper lip self and uh, there is another foil to him by this time captain haddock and uh, tintin stands in strong contrast to the captain the impulsive captain who loses his temper frequently while tintin remains equanimous uh, uh, he maintains his equanimity of temper in front of every trouble but in tintin in tibet you see that he loses this composure right at the beginning of the story when he is playing chess with captain haddock and Uh, there is something unthinkable which is happening here they are playing chess which is of course a very rational game a very cerebral game so to say and it is haddock who is actually thinking about the game more seriously and tintin surprisingly falls asleep which is very untintinian let's say uh, he falls asleep in the middle of an interesting cerebral game and then of course shouts out saying chan and startles everybody except uh, of course professor cuthbert calculus because he is absolutely deaf everyone uh, goes through a kind of uh, uh, a stage of astonishment while you see calculus in that panel sitting uh, without any kind of curve uh, in his face whatsoever because he can hear absolutely nothing 
and after that tintin tells haddock uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i was having a nightmare and then he could not sleep in the following night and then in the next morning he comes across the news of chang coming and he becomes extremely elated he starts dancing and uh, tells professor calculus well chang is coming professor chang is coming and calculus of course couldn't hear him and says champagne captain uh, you should not have given tintin champagne in this early hours of the day uh, and he also starts dancing with snowing i mean this is perhaps for the first time that we actually see tintin behaving as a young boy that he is in his appearance this is very untintinian tintin uh, breaking into a dance in happiness and shortly after when he finds out that chang must have been in that ill fated dc3 and when he confirms it from the newspaper he breaks down saying that oh my god chang is no more chang is no more and you find calculus saying well that is why one should not give champagne to a young person in such early hours of the day now why is calculus bringing this idea of champagne over and over i mean it is perhaps because rj wants us to note that this is how tintin is behaving he is behaving like an intoxicated man he is behaving absolutely irrationally breaking down into laughter and then crying out in the very next second this is not the calm and composed tintin we are accustomed to uh, this tintin is somebody whose let's say psychological uh, coping mechanisms have also kind of become weak he is showing his emotions more often than not but then again uh, and this is why friendship is such an important theme in this story he makes it makes up his mind to follow chang because he has a kind of strange belief in the nightmare he says that i so chang was alive so that must be the case and i must go to find him because he was asking for my help and then again you have uh, tintin of course does not go alone he has a couple of friends with him more than a couple of friends actually he has snowy and snowy of course is someone who is the only one who is present with tintin right from the beginning of his adventures right from tintin in the land of the soviets and this is uh, something which we must note that the bond between tintin and snowy is not that of a master and a pet it is that between friends and that is perhaps why uh, except in a couple of occasions uh, in uh, the sigars of the farao and else tintin is the only person who can converse with snowy for the others snowy's words are just the barkings of a dog for tintin they are actually words you find them conversing uh, snowy warning tintin tintin warning snowy scolding snowy and uh, in the course of this journey of course we see this bond of friendship snowy of course follows tintin without any whims he is the only one perhaps in this adventure who does not for a single moment feel uh, any kind of uh, let's say uh, repulsion or has any kind of complaint against tintin he never says that what you are doing is uh, uh, i i am not coming with you which even captain says on a couple of times i am not coming with you enough is enough uh, but snowy never says that he silently follows tintin's footprints and there is one place where uh, snowy of course he loves lockdown whiskey as much as captain haddock uh, so he gets drunk and he falls off into uh, Uh, a god and he falls in a mountainous stream and tintin uh, takes great pains to recover him and when he finds out that it's not because uh, uh, snowy was having vertigo but because he had gotten drunk that he fell off tintin sharply scolds him saying that um, another time i catch you doing something like this i am not going to save you and then so you always find this kind of uh, bond between tintin and snowy and it is of course snowy who saves tintin when he falls into that crevasse uh, um, in the blizzard uh, and it is snowy who sits there faithfully uh, beside the crevasse where tintin has fallen off and he steadily keeps on barking and when and uh, this is the brilliance of rj when he shows that uh, after a couple of hours when the blizzard has stopped snowy is almost covered head 
do uh, in snow but he is still kind of producing a sound and the sound of course has gone down from a well formed bark bho 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 Uh, to a mere ooh, something like this, and when Haddock uh, hears it, he says that well, it is uh, Snowy calling out, so something must have happened to Tintin. So Snowy actually saves Tintin's life. Uh, uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, so much for Snowy, and then of course you have uh, Professor Calculus. Uh, who was modeled on uh, the Swiss physicist Auguste Picard? Calculus, is, of course, is a walk-on role. He does not have much role here. He does not accompany them to the adventure. But uh, the same cannot be said about Captain Haddock, uh, another all-time pal of Tintin. He, of course, is extremely. Uh, uh, I mean, when we find him at the beginning, uh, when Tintin and Haddock are on a vacation in Hotel des Sommets in Versailles. Versailles is, of course, uh, a fictional kind of a place uh, in the Alpine mountains, uh, and uh, Harz himself uh, went to such places quite frequently. The holiday uh, destination, which is shown at the beginning panels of the book, uh, it is uh, there when uh, Haddock uh, quite. Uh, Early in the book, expresses his displeasure in mountaineering. He says that I don't find any fun there because ultimately, however uh, much you may go, you will ultimately have to return, right? You will have to come down. Uh, but uh, that is uh, the thing he is actually doing. Uh, he is accompanying Tintin in his journey. Uh, of course, he is furious when he finds. Uh, he is a bit disturbed when Tintin shouts out "Chang" because he thought Tintin has sneezed. But after that, as soon as he learns that Tintin was having a nightmare, his face looks concerned, and he tells Tintin that you better go sleep. You need rest. And when Tintin comes back in the next morning, the first question Haddock has for him is that "Good morning. Did you have a good night's sleep uh, yesterday?" And after that. When Tintin breaks down, and it's after uh, Tintin has this strange kind of a belief that Chang is alive, that Haddock grows furious. He tells Tintin, "I will not accompany you." And there is one panel where he uh, absolutely uh, loses his temper and tells Tintin that, "Well, you can go to Timbuktu, you can go to Vladivostok for all I care. I am not coming with you. Make that clear." Will you? And in the right, uh, in the panel right next to it, we can see Haddock and Tintin in New Delhi Airport. Uh, and Tintin's face. Uh, this is where the greatness of R.J. as an artist lies, right? Tintin's face, facial expression shows that he's still concerned for Chang, while Haddock's expression. Uh, I mean, he has an expression as if he has not. Um, I mean, his stomach has not cleared in that morning. Uh, Uh, because he is extremely displeased and he is uh, is chewing down on his pipe, it makes it abundantly clear. He does not want to come, but he cannot leave Tintin as well. And this kind of uh, love hate relationship with the adventure goes on for Haddock throughout the book. Uh, there are a couple of times when he makes up his mind to desert Tintin uh, after they have reached the the site of uh, the accident. And let me say here that the site of the accident. Uh, uh, The ill-fated DC three. It was actually uh, constructed uh, by Hard from a real crash site photograph, uh, the real photograph of crashed DC six airliner and the accident site, uh, Goshai Thaan Massif. Uh, they were constructed from real photographs, and uh, when. RJ was uh, extremely uh, careful about uh, drawing the real emblem of Air India, and there is one Air India official who actually complained RJ that why have you shown our aircraft crashing? This sends a wrong message to the world because none of our planes have crashed till date. We think of ourselves as a very safe facility. So that is where you find that RJ changes uh, the name of the plane from Air India to the fictional Sari Airways. Uh, so when they reach that crash site, Haddock once again decides to leave Tintin, uh, and it is after that. When Tintin gives him a bit of brandy, and Haddock suddenly gets back the power and says that, and says that uh, I will continue on my path. And again, uh, when they reach the Korbiyong Monastery, uh, 
the Corbion Monastery, of course, was again taken from a real, uh, the photograph of a real monastery, the Druin Hill Monastery in Lhasa, in Tibet. Uh, Haddock refuses to follow Tintin when he goes to the Tarabang village, but then, of course, he comes back. Uh, he comes back, and when he we find him uh, coming back, he's of course a bit, uh, let's say, a bit ashamed of himself. And in his typical pseudo modest way, he replies that, "Well, I have uh, your camera, so I thought I'll have to give it back." So I came back. But uh, we know better, right? We know that he has come back because he could not leave Tintin in the face, uh, in the face of the yeti alone. He loves Tintin too much for doing something like that. And especially there is that heart-touching scene where Haddock is hanging from. Uh, the cliff. He has lost his grip and uh, he says that uh, we should not die both. Uh, let me save you and let me cut the rope myself. And he takes out his knife. He tries cutting the rope but his fingers have frozen uh, and then uh, before anything happens, Tharke comes back and saves the day. And this is where we have another remarkable character, Tharke. He of course was again modeled on a real life character. A Nepali mountaineer and Tharke. When we find him uh, initially, he's a professional guide and he straight away tells them, I can't go there because nobody can be left alive. It's absolutely unbelievable. But then when he starts on the journey, he's, he's still the professional guide and <clears throat> he goes into a contract with uh, the mountaineers that he will take them to the site of the crash and no more. He will return from there. And let me remind you that it is Captain Haddock who actually fixes all these people, right? Um, Tintin, when he was making preparations alone, unbeknownst to him, uh, Haddock has gone to the porters and the Sherpas and he has assembled a whole team. So he has actually acted as the captain there. He is the one captaining this journey, so to say. And if you remember the first panel where they are actually setting off, it is Haddock who is at the front. It is Haddock at the front. After that, you see Tintin and Tharke side by side. And then, of course, a band of porters. But then, uh, of course, hilariously enough, Haddock uh, loses uh, his energy and we find him steadily going to the back uh, when he almost doubles up and then he has a bottle of whiskey and then gets an enormous amount of energy back in his veins and starts running like a possessed man. So it is actually Haddock in the first panel who is at the helm of the journey. And it is he who has actually assembled the people. Uh, he is the one captaining uh, the journey, so to say. And again, when uh, when Tharke reaches the crash site and he leaves, we find Tintin telling him that, well, it is time to, uh, let's say, settle down your payments, right? And uh, Tharke uh, is peacefully sitting there, Tintin settling down all the payments, Tharke taking the money, going back. So till now we see one Tharke, the professional guide, and then we see him back in another avatar when he saves uh, Haddock and Tintin from dying. And then he says, when I go back to the village, I think about you white men going for your friends and me yellow man being a coward. I don't want to be a coward, so I come back. Uh, so and then you see his human side. He's not just a professional guide, but he is a human being as well. And from then onwards, whatever he does for the mountaineers, it's not for his payment. He has already done what he was meant to do. Uh, he does that for the bond of friendship. Tharke is not a professional guide anymore. Whatever he is doing after this, uh, spotting the monastery and uh, going with them, he does as a friend and of course after that his hand breaks so he is unable to continue in his journey anymore because he has already become injured uh, and then of course there is Tintin and Chan, the friendship uh, this is the bond which actually takes the story forward right this is the one which uh, sets the ball rolling and you have Tintin Amidst all this whiteness, the whiteness, of course, comes from Harj's own nightmares, the white Himalayas, uh, which Harj, perhaps, uh, that was the point of him, his writing the book. He wanted to show that this, I mean, uh, he 
somehow you find that this is a book where he has risen above uh, regional politics and wants to give a universal message as well and the universal message is this this is how the world is supposed to be barren uh, where you are essentially alone except a handful of trustworthy friends it is let's say dangerous where there are crevasses and uh, class sites waiting for you waiting to take you down but the only things you can rely on are a couple of friends a trustworthy friends like say snowy or tharke or a haddock who will watch your back no matter what happens uh, and that is what essentially happens after right uh, when tintin finds out chang chang tells him that i knew you would come uh, i had uh, i had thought about you time and time again and uh, indeed tintin has come at the end and then of course you have the eat the abominable snowman who is not at all abominable and let me tell you that this was a point uh, when rj was writing tintin in tibet the western world was actually going gaga about citing some eat and uh, rj found a book which was gifted by his friend bernard hubelmans uh the book was named on the tracks of unknown animals which had a whole section on yeti and also he had met other uh explorers uh who had and he had read uh, the accounts of other explorers like Fosco Mareni Henry Carrer Sevang Pemba Maurice Harjog and Cyril Hoskins and all of them who had gone into Tibet and uh, wrote a line or two about the yeti uh RJ uh, RJ religiously followed those accounts and uh, he took extreme pains to represent the yeti as much being truthful to the travelers accounts as possible and from the very outset he makes it clear in his interview to numa sadul that he wanted to make the yeti a lovable creature not the violent uh, monster which the west has made it out to be but also another being who yearns for friendship this is what he actually tells sadul my yeti was to be a being who searches for friendship who is eager for friends he is another person in this uh, let's say this empty world who wants a friend who clings on to chang as soon as he finds him and he goes into great pains to save chang from any kind of trouble he brings him uh, roots dead animals biscuit tins from the crash site uh, and when uh, let's say he uh initially when he roars on seeing tintin uh, it's precisely because he is afraid about chang's safety he of course doesn't know that tintin is a friend to chang uh, so that and that and uh, this is where harje shows friendship to traverse numerous stereotypes his friendship is something which traverses the bonds of rationality because you find tintin seeing chang and chang seeing tintin chang thinking about tintin and tintin seeing chang in his nightmares at precisely the same point so you see there is a there is this telepathic connection happening between these two friends so hartz's bond of friendship is something which defies uh, let's say the categories of rationality the categories of western reason and uh, <coughs> this is what uh, which happens again in the case of uh, the blessed lightning right when the blessed lightning uh, i mean there is a point where it seems that their journey have almost ended uh, there has been a landslide and tintin has broken his ankle they are lying down in jord and this is exactly where the blessed lightning has his vision i mean he says that i see three people there is one boy who has a big heart and then you see again snowy saving the day he sets out with that uh, uh he sets out with that uh, the small chit of paper loses it but nevertheless goes to the monastery and when he is about uh, to be beaten into pulp by the uh, the guards uh, the blessed lightning's uh, sidekick he comes and tells them that this might be the white dog whom uh, our guru saw in his vision don't kill him and then it is actually <coughs> because of this vision because of this uh, let's say the strange uh, visionary power the strange power of clear voice let's say which uh, the blessed lightning has that uh, 
Tintin and the others find refuge in the monastery. Uh, and uh, let me tell you that uh, levitation and uh, visions is another thing which these travelers, people like uh, Fosco Marini and uh, Harar and uh, Hoskins wrote time and again in their uh, travel books about Tibet. And uh, uh, and then, of course, there is uh, the friendship of the Yeti. And uh, both in the case of the Yeti and Snowy, you find friendship crossing that human-non-human -human bond. Tintin is a human while Snowy is not, but that doesn't stop them from becoming fast friends. So is the case between Yeti and Chang. Yeti is, of course, not human, but Chang tells Tintin at the end that I am telling you, Tintin, the way he took care of me, it almost made me feel that he had an almost human soul inside of him. And when Tintin tells him that uh, at the end, when it is almost a bittersweet ending, when uh, the Yeti is yelling, uh, it, it's almost wailing because he has lost his friend. And Tintin tells Chang that the Yeti will again roam around all alone in these Himalayas until one man from any expedition team manages to catch him. Catch, the word itself is significant because catch means, uh, catch is a word which has other connotations with it. Connotations of, let's say, imprisonment, torture, violence. I mean, we catch guinea pigs, we catch frogs for laboratory experiments, right? And that is, uh, I mean, we become sure that that is the sense in which Harge meant the word. Uh, uh, because uh, after that you find Chang saying, uh, Tintin, I wish nobody finds him because they will see him only as an animal. But I know that he's so much more than that. He has compassion. He has, he also yearns for friendship. And uh, let me tell you here that uh, quite early on in his career, RJ had started breaking up this human non human bond because even in uh, his second work congo tintin where you find tintin indiscriminately hunting down animals which is of course very untintinesque as we find tintin in the later adventures but even in that early book when he is uh, let's say killing the giraffes uh, uh, at the end uh, of the book you find snowy chipping in saying i don't like torturing animals. So there you have Snowy, who is empath empathizing or sympathizing with the animals, let's say. And then, of course, when you come to, let's say, uh, a book like uh, Seagulls of the Pharaoh, you see that Tintin is, uh, I mean, he's befriending elephants. In Congo, Tintin, he was killing elephants, hunting elephants. And in Pharaoh et Churut or Sigas of the Pharaoh, you see he's actually befriending animals. So Tintin has come a long way. He has started feeling a lot about animals. Of course, you find him tying up a Royal Bengal tiger, which is uh, almost ridiculous uh, because Haj was, Ajay was uh, not researching seriously about India in uh, the Sigas of the Pharaoh because he shows a Royal Bengal tiger sitting on a tree. I mean, that's almost unpardonable uh, mistake. Uh, and then Tintin uh, ties up that Royal Bengal Tiger. But then increasingly, as you go into Tintin's adventures, you repeatedly see RJ taking pains to prove that animals whom we think as bloodthirsty may not be so. Remember the gorilla from the Black Island, Ranko. He initially comes across as a bloodthirsty monster, but he's actually not so. And he's afraid of uh, Snowy's barking. Uh, so, uh, the idea of uh, great, big, powerful, bloodthirsty animals, which we have in our mind, is completely broken down because Ranko is afraid of Snowy. And then Snowy gets, uh, and uh, that is something which uh, RJ has also shown in Congo Tintin. The lion was also afraid of Snowy because Snowy has bitten off its tail. Uh, and in uh, the Black Island, of course, it is much more obvious. And Snowy itself says that how can a big gorilla like him be afraid of a puny dog like me and he gets the answer right after because he's also afraid of a puny spider and the spider is almost nothing compared to snowy but it makes snowy run away in terror so that's what happens right it's not about i mean uh, violence is uh, directly proportional to size and bloodthirst is directly proportional to a volume of an animal or something like that rj always takes pains uh, in showing that the animals who, who come across as violent in first chance may not be so. Even in Tintin in Tibet, there is that yak 
when it comes and starts chewing at the scarf of Tintin. Uh, Snowy says that, oh, that monster will kill Tintin. But then, of course, the yak itself becomes afraid when Tintin shouts out, oh my god, and it runs away. Even the yak is a very timid creature. So is the Yeti. It longs for friendship. Uh, and uh, then, uh, let me tell you that another thing which uh, I must mention before I end is uh, you often say people saying that Tintin in Tibet does not have a real life politics. It is a book where RJ has completely risen above petty politics and it's all about uh, humanist universal values. And so let me tell you that there are uh, there is more to that. He is still uh, taking into account contemporary politics here because if you look at Tibetan history during the times when RJ was writing this book, Tibet was going through a crisis during this period. Of course, the direct, uh, let's say, the direct reason why RJ started writing this book may be because he was collaborating on a play, uh, Mr. Bullard's Disappearance, uh, in Belgium, along with a couple of his friends, which showed Tintin going to Argentina, then Morocco, then Tibet, and uh, it is then when he first got the idea of taking Tintin into Tibet. But anyway, Tibet itself was also passing through a period of crisis during this time. Uh, because this is the period when China is becoming increasingly imperialist. And China has sent... Peking has sent 40,000 troops from uh, the PLA, uh, the People's Liberation Army, to Tibet during these times. And Tibet was forced into signing a 17-point uh, agreement uh, where they more or less become a colony of China. And the situation became so much worse that Dalai Lama in 1959 had to flee to India. Uh, so, uh, and... And then you read Tintin in Tibet and you find that the Tibetan people being, let's say, documented as poor, the people in Charabang, the, uh, the poor villagers, uh, the poor village kids who are running around in tattered clothes. And you find that uh, RJ is actually making a point about the oppression of the local Tibetans in the hand of the Chinese. And this is something which RJ has always done during the later end of his career. He has consistently refused to take sides. Uh, in Blue Lotus, you find him supporting the Chinese common people who are suffering under the Japanese. And now you uh, see him taking the side of the Tibetans. And it is now the Chinese who are the oppressors. And if you look at the plot of the story, it is beautiful in the sense that the Peking uh, invasion, the Chinese invasion had, has left a lot of Tibetans homeless. There are a lot of newspaper reports regarding this during this period. A lot of Tibetans were left homeless. They were driven away from uh, Tibet by the Chinese. Uh, and in this story, you find exactly the reverse. You find the Chinese and the outsiders given refuge in Tibet. Tibet. On the one hand, you find imperialist China driving away Tibetans from their land. On the other hand, you find in this book, Tibetans giving refuge to outsiders and the Chinese. It is the Korbyong Monastery in Tibet which gives refuge to these outsiders, Tintin and Captain Haddock. And Captain Haddock even, uh, I mean, he commits a sin of coming uh, with boots in the sanctum sanctorum of the monastery in front of the grand abbot and they even forgive that because captain of course does not know their customs uh, and they even uh, give Tintin that kind of a grand welcome at the end when they bring the pipe and the scarf and the grand about gifts him with the scarf names him a boy with the big heart uh, and they uh, and then you again find the Yeti who is actually a Tibetan, right? In the sense that he lives in Tibet. And whom is he giving refuge to? Chang, who happens to be a Chinese. So, my, I mean, uh, nowhere could RJ be more clear, right? You have in real life the Chinese imperialists driving out Tibetan refugees. And on the other, other hand, you find the Tibetan Yeti giving refuge to the Chinese Chang who has lost everything. I mean, this certainly is a message in this book. RJ talking about the book having a message, this is one. So, definitely. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, this book, of course, is uh, 
it uh, makes a definite point about rj taking great pains to uh, let's say depict the non europeans i mean when you see rj let's say i mean let, let's take the topic of india right when you uh, see rj depicting india in let's say faraway troop uh, i mean uh, the i mean it's obvious that he has not done much research uh, the guy uh, the indian king is named strangely guy pajama i mean which almost sounds like guy in the pajamas i mean uh, how can uh, this be an indian territory i mean the name does not sound indian enough it's uh, an easily cooked up name that's very much obvious and then rj committing mistakes like uh, showing a royal bengal tiger on uh, sitting on a tree and then the indian fakir uh, i mean he committing unbelievable feats and then of course uh, the uh, the gang of thugs kidnapping snowy and then uh, sacrificing him before the altar of shiva they call it shiva but it is actually the altar of nataraja so Uh, they use the north indian name but it is actually the south indian nataraja and they tell uh, snowy that he is a kafir which is anyway uh, kafir is a term used by the muslims right uh, so uh, rj has completely uh, jumbled up things here we know being indians uh, so from then onwards when you come to tintin in tibet and you find the, and you see that the small chapter in delhi and from there when they go to nepal rj's research has come a long way uh, from then onwards when you see when you compare it to the scenes of kutub minar and the red fort they almost look like real picture postcards and when it comes to kathmandu uh, they come to kathmandu that uh, the the snap of the pashupati nath temple you can see it in that panel uh, they are so exact and painstakingly detailed and uh, then uh, again the the structure of the korbiong monastery the structure of the shorten uh, he has definitely come a long way uh, after the blue lotus he is now taking great pains in let's say delineating the Uh, non-European cultures, let's say, um, and this is one reason why we love RJ so much, right? I mean, Michael Farr writes that every firearm in his book was an exact copy from the catalogs. Every dresses are almost copied from real fashion magazines. Every airplane looks like an exact model. This is one thing which RJ is brilliant in reproducing the details, especially in his later works, and then. Uh, uh well uh, let me finish with saying one uh, final thing that it is this bond of friendship which you see rj relying more and more on in his later tintin works i mean uh, tintin's works of course are very much political and what does rj think of politics uh, i don't think he supports any party or any uh, kind of uh, propaganda whatsoever he does not uh, for, uh, support any grand narrative if i use post modernist terms uh, very early on in the broken year he has shown those two uh, countries the fictional countries san theodoras and uh, nuevo rico which are of course uh, thinly veiled bolivia and uh, uh, thinly veiled bolivia and paraguay who were uh, engaged in a bloodthirsty battle uh, regarding the oil fields of grand chaco and grand chaco of course becomes grand chapo in the broken year and what does he show there neither alcazar nor the nuevo rican uh, republican head is shown to be above faults they are both power hungry men they are both stupid men they oppress the common people in order to get powers uh alcazar uh, becomes friends with tintin and there is one brilliant scene where tintin gets absolutely drunk and shouts out alcazar uh, long live alcazar and that is how they make him a colonel of the army because uh, alcazar has won and he has become the new general uh, so tintin becomes friends with alcazar and later alcazar distrusts him sentences him to death and you find the same person basil bazarov uh, selling arms to both these uh, powers and it is america and britain uh, who are actually egging on bolivia and paraguay uh, san theodoras and nuevo rico to engage in a bloodthirsty war because they want those oil fields 
so these uh, south american so called independent countries are used as puppets by the british and the americans and uh, rj is supporting no one here uh, but it is this same alcazar again whom tintin helps in tintin and the picaros which is one of the most brilliant works by rj the last completed tintin uh, album where he shows that uh, they are supporting alcazar and they are supporting him in a military coup uh, where he ousts tapioca and the san theodoran head and alcazar gets power and later in a brilliant uh, panel you see uh, tapioca telling alcazar uh, so now you will have me imprisoned and killed right and alcazar tells him no you will be set free you will be given a plane because this guy tintin has made me promise that i will not kill anyone i will not spill even a drop of blood in this revolution tapioca of course is scandalized he is saying that how can this be what will the people think so it's all a show right it's a brilliant moment in the book it's arjes ultimate condemning of politics uh, they are not uh, worried about uh, losing power because they know they will get it once again i mean tapioca and alcazar they almost uh, ridiculously a change power between themselves it's one and then again it's the other again the one again the other and the the only thing they are worried about is not governance they are worried about preserving their image in front of the people tapioca tells alcazar that do not set me free because uh, then i will have no prestige left i mean he is not worried about uh, losing his life all he is worried about is losing his prestige in front of the people so it's all a show and when alcazar tells him that i didn't want to set you free it is this boy tintin who has made me promise so what can i do and then in a panel you see both of them uh, taking their heads close to each other and confiding almost like close friends that yeah tapioca tells him that i understand this guy tintin is an idealist these people are dangerous right they don't know how we do things in the actual world and alcazar tells him these are bad days my friend so that's an ultimate condemnation and satirization of the revolt i mean the person who has taken power and the person who has lost power they are shown in the same panel confiding to one another and they have a common person whom they are condemning tintin because he is an idealist because ideas ideals do not hold good in the real world right politicians are rotten people anyway no matter what party they belong to that seems to be rj's ultimate uh, let's say uh, bottom line and in the final panel you see that the uh, the couple of picaros who are holding batons and they are uh, going uh, the, they are circling the same place where we saw written long live tapioca police and there were poor people all around they were living in shanties and you have the uh, the tapiocan officials who are waving batons uh, quite early on in the in the album and then after the change in power comes in the uh, the last but one the penultimate panel you see it is now alcazar picaros who have become the new officials and they are now waving their batons it is the same place the same shanty the same poor people only the writing on the board has changed from a uh, long live tapioca police to long live alcazar and uh, right uh, in the fashion where tapioca has changed the name of the capital of Tan- san theodoros from los topicos to tapioca police alcazar has now changed the name of the capital to alcazar police so it is the same style going round and round uh, so amidst all these things the only bottom line for rj uh, seems to be that uh it's a big bad world anyway where everyone is shit everyone is just worried about power uh all you have is friends because after all uh, tintin is helping alcazar right and why is he helping him because alcazar is a good friend it is only because of that they are not worried about his principles at all and that is exactly why tintin makes him promise that he will not spill any blood because tintin knows he is as much blood thirsty as tapioca but they help him because he is their friend after all and friends are all we have in this life that is what tintin and the picaro says that is what tintin in tibet says as well how far can you go in search of a friend like akshay kumar says how far can you go in search of a thumbs up uh, in search of their friend they travel to far away tibet and brings back chang and again uh, who again was living with another friend of his the yeti so friendship seems to rule this story from the beginning till the end thank you thank you so much